Um, so thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks to Max for the invitation uh, and uh, Cal State Long Beach for hosting. Um, <clears throat> so we're actually going to start, there's going to be about, like, let's say, three or four times when I'm just going to ask you to come up to take a look at something uh, that you can't see where you're sitting. So we're going to start with that right away. And then I'm going to let you sit down after, after that for a few minutes. But why don't you guys just come up here for a second? This is the optional part of the demo. If you want to put your fingers in here, there's like paper for you right here. It's kind of like just to get a sense of like what it feels like. It's not scary. If it gets on your clothes, it comes right out. You have to wash them. Um, what is that exactly? So this is basically we call this slip. It's just liquid clay. The interesting thing about it is that, um, what's your name? Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, do you mind holding this for whoever wants to stick their fingers in there again? Maybe they want to go. Yeah. This is kind of like a dare. See if you guys will really do it. So Daniel asked a simple question, which is, what is it? It is basically just liquid clay. The one thing is, is that if you have too much water in your clay when you're casting, it starts to crack over time. So this actually has something in it. It's basically the same as the clay that you guys have, if you've ever thrown a pot or done anything, it's basically the same as that clay. But it has a chemical in it that's called a deflocculant that basically takes the, the clay molecules and lets them slide past one another instead of sticking on one another, which basically makes it feel like a liquid without having any more water in it, which is kind of awesome. Um, because what we want to do is we want to use our plaster mold to draw all the water out. And the less water we have in here, the less work our mold has to do, which is awesome. So I'm going to start just by pouring this in. You guys, if you want to just crowd around, you can see as best as possible. And we'll see how good my aim is. OK. Pretty easy, right? So I would like you to just like take a look at um, where the clay is. It's basically the liquid level is pretty much even with the top of the mold, right? If you guys can see that. Just keep an eye on it. It's going to change over time. Um, I actually want to grab this mold for a second. OK, so these are bigger molds. They're more complex. We may or may not have enough. We probably won't have enough slip to fill this all the way. But we can see this is what it's going to produce, right? So we know already what this, what this mold makes. Um, if I put this back in here, anybody want to make an observation about that? Shrunk. It shrunk. Yeah, like a significant amount. Let's say, like, for those of you who are, whether you're in interior design, industrial design, whatever it is, you can imagine that if you're working with clay or any ceramic products, whatever you design with, Let's say I'm, I'm doing all my designing in uh, digital modeling, right? Like, whatever dimensions I put inside my digital modeling software is not what I get here, right? Like, it shrinks by a significant amount, sometimes as much as 10 or 15 percent. When you're trying to get pieces and components to work together and they're shrinking while you're making them, it's a whole added level of complexity, right? Um, which I'll talk about this in a little bit. That's one of the reasons that I started to work with clay, because I actually wanted that, um, let's say I wanted to play that game. Uh, I want to pass that around. All right, so I'm just going to like clean out my mold just a little bit. Why does it shrink? Why does it shrink? Anybody have a guess as to why it shrinks? Water dampness. Yeah, we've lost a significant amount of our volume that was water. That's pretty much it. Um, I don't know if you guys, for those of you who are close, you might be able to see the amount of clay in here actually stays the same, but the volume has changed because some of our water has already started going into our plaster mold. So right now I have something that's kind of like a concave surface, and this will get even more extreme over time. All right.
So some of this you guys don't need to know unless you're really going to do slip casting. Some of it I think you do need to know whether or not you're ever going to do slip casting because it's just some of the things that as I work with clay, uh, some of the challenges I've found, they're challenges that we all have when we work with materials no matter what they are. You, if anybody has ever built with wood, you know that wood expands over time depending on humidity. Um, clay does it in just a much more extreme way because it does it almost right in front of your face. Whereas for wood, if that's going to change its dimensions according to humidity levels in the atmosphere, you may not register that it's actually shrinking or expanding um, until a day later or something. But for, for what we're going to do right now, I'm going to pour this in. I'm going to try pour it slowly, and I'm going to try not to splash it. Because what happens is as soon as this liquid clay touches the plaster, it starts to dry. Not a ton, but it starts, right? Um, so it means that if I pour it in and it splashes and there's like a little bit that gets over here and this starts to dry, and then as my clay level rises, it finally swallows that little, those little drips. There might be a seam line between the drips and the rest of the clay cast simply because one portion has started to dry before the rest of it. So again, we'll see how good my aim is. So this is our this is the start of our clay cast. You can see I didn't have enough clay slip to actually fill the mold completely. I kind of knew that'd be a problem. Um, I could mix it with this over here, but it's a slightly different clay body, so I'm actually going to try to keep them separate. And we're just going to have a partially filled mold. I'm going to just like seal this back up, and we're just going to let things sit for a while. But does anybody notice anything about the one we started doing a little bit earlier. Can you guys see anything that's changed yet besides just the level of our liquid clay going down? You can see the dry clay, clay inside. Yeah, so there's like a little bit of a surface here that at this moment it's about just over one millimeter thick. Over time, that's going to keep on getting thicker and thicker as the clay that's touching the plaster starts to solidify. And what it's trying to do then is the plaster is still wicking away water from the clay that's still liquid, and it's doing that through the clay that's already starting to dry. So we can leave it in here for an, a couple hours, and it'll get thicker and thicker. At a certain point, it's harder and harder for the, the water to make it through the clay that's already dry. Um, what we would normally do, if I were really doing like um, a cast that I were going to try sell or something like that, if this were a real product, I would keep topping this off. Like as I'm losing volume of liquid here, I would keep putting more in. For the moment, let's just say in terms of showing the process, it's actually nicer to see the way that this is, um, that we're getting to see that little thickness there. What this also means is that at this moment, I don't really have an accurate understanding of how thick my cast is because we can guess that since the clay below the, let's say the water level of the clay, our thickness is still increasing, whereas above the water level of the clay, it stays the same, right? So normally what I could do is if I kept on topping this off, I could move a little bit of the liquid out of the way, and I could always tell exactly how thick my cast is going to be. At the moment, yeah, we're going to guess that it's like a little bit thicker than this without knowing exactly how much thicker. Oh, uh, yeah. So if you wanted to make something that was just a shell, could you then wait uh, less time than usual and then just pour out the rest, and then you're left with the shell? Yeah, OK, so that's a really good question because it means um, I forgot to mention one of the most important things. It's almost always a shell. Okay. Right? So if you look at the examples that I gave, this one, this one, I don't know where my little green guy went. Let me pass that over. Yeah. These are all shells, right? Like they're all basically somewhere, there's a sweet spot like right around five millimeters thick, four millimeters thick, quarter of an inch thick, something like that. Um, it does some really nice things like Clay, there's always problems. Whenever you work with clay, let's say you cast, or let's say you throw a pot on a wheel, that thing starts to shrink slightly differently if the walls of your pot are thinner than the base of your pot. And if they shrink at different rates, then it might crack, right? So the nice thing about this process is it's almost exactly the same thickness everywhere, which is pretty awesome 
let's say it helps you counter one of the inherent problems of working with clay, which is that there's always the, the possibility of having differential shrinkage, which makes for basically catastrophic failure, right? Like things just break. Um, whether or not they break while they're in your hands and you're working with them, or they break when they're in the kiln and you're firing them, they break, and that's not so fun. Um, okay, so we're going to let this guy go for a little bit longer, and I'm going to show you some slides. Okay, so this, I almost don't need to show this. Like, I usually show this in my lecture, but you guys already know all this, right? Like, we just saw it. You've got your liquid clay, your slip. You pour it in, you fill it up to the top. The water wicks out. Sorry, the plaster wicks out some of the water. And then what we're going to do, and what you haven't seen yet, is that we pour out any of the clay that's still liquid. We let this clay just sit in there, and we let it dry even more. And then ultimately, we treat it just like we would treat anything else that we've produced using clay. Right? So if you throw a pot, you let the thing sit out, and you let it dry for a couple of days, and then you put it in the kiln. You fire it, you take it out, you usually paint some glaze on it, you put it back in the kiln, you fire it even higher, and then you have something that looks something like this. Right? So that's, those are effectively our basic steps. So who's in industrial design, by the way, just out of curiosity? Who's in interiors, interior design? OK. So one of the things I love about clay is that it's democratic in a way, like anybody can do it. Like the stuff that I'm showing you right now, like you don't need to go to school for it. You don't need to go to undergrad. You don't need to go to graduate. Anybody can do it, right? And, and there are so many people who do, like a lot of the, the equipment that I'm buying or the molds, like the first mold that we cast, I bought that mold somewhere around here in Long Beach for $5 because I just needed to have something to do demos with, like today. The other two molds I made myself, and they took a long time, and they were quite difficult. But the first one we did, that small one, I just paid five bucks for it, right? Like, this is not anything that's like rarefied. You don't have to have super good software. You don't have to have an amazing garage with all sorts of equipment in it. Like, anybody can do it. At the same time, it's like a process that is industrialized to a certain extent, and certainly in terms of the amount of production that happens. So, any toilet that you find in the world at this moment in time, if it's a porcelain toilet, it was produced using the exact method that I just showed you. How to do. So if you want, you'll be able to go home and you'll be able to make that or that um, after today. And send me a photo of your first toilet bowl when you make one because I'll be totally curious to see it. Um, just a note on toilets. Um, they're incredibly complex formally. Like as an industrial design challenge, trying to figure out a way to produce this without slip casting is almost impossible. If you think about all the different cavities in there and how many different mold parts you need to produce that, it is super, super difficult. But the great thing about slip casting, which is different from almost all other mold cast processes, is that you can produce something, like I can produce this cavity right here without having to have a mold form for that, because I can produce it with a mold on this side and then something from the other side, basically. So it's super low tech, and at the same time, it's like one of the only ways we can produce certain forms. So basically, to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm trained as an architect. I have taught uh, architecture. I've taught interior architecture. I've taught ceramics. Um, and in some weird way, I like fell into this world of ceramics that at first it started off as it, it was like a parallel project next to everything that else I was doing in my career. And then it slowly started to inform everything that I was doing in my career, whether or not I was working with clay. And that's a little bit like, I think that's the main point that I'd like to talk to you about today, is show you some examples of the work that I've been doing that are very directly working with clay, and then other examples of my work that somehow are informed by the work with clay that I would say try to understand this earthen intelligence that I believe comes out of clay. Uh, and so to just show you some of the projects that I've worked on that at first, I had nothing to do with clay, at least not consciously. Um, my office, Radical Craft, works on large scale, almost like landscape scale proposals or infrastructural scale proposals. This was for uh, um, the World Sustainability Center uh, off the coast of Holland, which was basically like an architecture and landscape project together. This was an installation at the storefront for art and architecture in New York City. This was one of the first environmentally responsive installations in that when you would walk past it, all of these fins would move and track your motion. 
so it felt like this big furry creature, almost like a reef uh, with all these sea anemone gathered on it. It was called Reef, actually. Um, and then I also work in public art. Uh, this was a commission for a, a new entryway to El Paso City Hall. And you can see, like, in a way, it's just like an entryway, but it's also a restructuring, not necessarily in terms of physical structure, but in terms of organizational structure for the entire entry experience of that building. And so today, again, like lessons from ceramics, things that I have learned from ceramics. And so I'll go through and I'll talk about a couple projects, starting with one that's very directly ceramic based. But I also think I have to empty my mold right now. Otherwise, I'll get something that's too thick. So I'm going to empty this. Anybody who wants to come look is welcome. I'll try to show you as best as I can. All right, so there's kind of like a similar trick. I just want to, in this case, I want to get this stuff out almost as fast as possible without making too many drips. Does this look like anything yet? Yeah, you guys can't see. All right, I'm going to leave this kind of draining into my little uh, gallon bucket. Can anybody guess what would happen if I flipped this back over and just left it sit that way? It would drip down. The clay that's still liquid in there would drip down. And basically, I would have something that would be thicker on the bottom than on the sides, which was one of the problems I um, pointed out in just standard wheel throwing. Or maybe I would, if I were to wait a little bit and then tip it back over, like there would still be a little bit of liquid at the bottom, which is really the top. And that would drip back down and leave all these dripping streaks on the interior of my, um, of my cast. Is that a problem? Only if people are going to see the interior, right? You guys will like the, um, that precious moments little figurine that I showed. Now that, now that you've seen slip casting, you'll find all of these objects in the world. It's like the first time that somebody tells you about vacuum forming. Like all of a sudden, you, you start to realize all the things in the world that are produced through vacuum forming. Um, Ashtrays, cups, mugs. There's so many things that you guys interface with every day that is made through slip casting. And from now on, you'll, you'll think to yourself, oh, is there an interior to this? And sometimes you can actually see the interior. Um, so Tectonic Horizons, again, one of the first projects that I made using clay directly. And this will answer, hopefully answer Max's question, um, how were the molds produced? So most of what I've been doing, my interest in clay, let's say my background is that I was, my architectural schooling was pretty much all digital, right? So I didn't really build that many physical models. It wasn't very hands-on in terms of working with materials. We did everything digitally in the computer, digital modeling, digital simulation, everything. Um, and so when I graduated school, I realized like, oh, I got a great education, but I still have one half of an education that I still need to somehow figure out how to, how to give to myself. Um, so that's basically why I started working with clay. My goal was to figure out a way to take all of the digital skills that I had learned and try to figure out what happens when they rub against the materiality of clay. And I picked clay because it was probably the most difficult material I could think of. Again, the fact that it kind of, it's a, almost literally a moving target. It's changing its shape as you're trying to help give it shape. Um, but the mold making process is one of the areas where you have the most direct control. So with a CNC router, we were able to, I was able to like basically digital model things and then start to carve these forms out of uh, cast plaster. So I cast a, pl a plaster blank. Does anybody know anything about shaping surfboards? We're like, we're in the land of shaping surfboards. All that stuff happens like right around here. Often with, surf with uh, shaping a surfboard, you start with just a foam blank. It's more or less the shape of your surfboard. And then you shape it by hand, right? Um, so in here, with these plaster molds, it's kind of similar. You start with a plaster blank that's more or less the size that you want. And then you send it to the digital mill, which starts to carve that geometry away based on whatever you have um, in your digital modeling software. So for this project, my, my goal was to test um, exactly what it is 
which aspects of my final object will be informed by the digital process and which aspects will be informed by the material process. Basically trying to unravel or delaminate the assumption that unlike 3D printing, there's this idea that everything that you have on your screen, you just press print and you get exactly the same thing in the physical world. This was a, a project to kind of challenge that idea. So these are the guys that I modeled. They looked exactly like this in, I was using uh, rhinoceros, rhino. And so the idea was then to figure out like what, uh, there's a certain amount of precision that we need in the milling process. Where is that precision absolutely necessary and where is it optional and therefore aesthetic? So the first kind of set of steps for this was to um, look at the mold that I had and determine like, okay, if this is one mold half that's gonna fit into another mold half, if those two halves don't fit perfectly and produce a watertight connection, I'm gonna have slip, kind of like slipping out everywhere at all of the seams. You can imagine that first thing that I did, which is a two-part mold, if I hadn't put the clamp on there, or if my two pieces, if there was like a little uh, speck of plaster in between there and those two halves didn't meet perfectly, it would create a gap, and then as I poured the liquid slip in, it would just go everywhere. We'd have a huge mess on the floor. We may still a little bit later, but uh, the mess would start earlier. Um, so one of the most important things was to find out like, okay, where do I need to have precision in my milling process? And then where do I have some kind of artistic freedom? These blue surfaces are any surfaces that are planar. They're perfectly flat and they're planar, and they need to match up with the, the perfectly flat planar side on the other side of the mold. So that needs to be perfectly milled. It can, I can't have like ridges or bumps or anything there. The areas that are red are non-planar, but they still have to match perfectly to the other side. So these are the areas that actually create the most problem. Um, this gets into a little bit of a technical situation with um, most milling tools. You can either have a flat end to your tool or you can have a round end. And the only way that you can create rounded surfaces are if you have a round tool. Um, but that also means that it starts to leave a whole bunch of scallops or bumps every time you, you carve um, one line across to produce that surface. So basically, what this told me was that the red was going to take the most amount of time because I had to like have really, really high resolution. I had to go back and forth as many times as possible to get that surface to be as smooth as possible um, with my digital mill. The blue also had to be as smooth as possible, but it could be produced very easily with just a flat end mill. It just kind of carves it, carves that flat surface with no problems. The gray was totally optional in terms of how much, how precise the resolution needed to be. So when I started milling, I decided I was going to take advantage of the gray areas and say, I was just gonna let those be, I was gonna let the machine do it in the fastest, easiest way possible, and I wasn't gonna tell it it needed high precision. So this is the, the milling process. You start with a roughing cut, and then you go into smoothing it out, carving out more and more. You can see here, this is gonna be one of those registration keys. It's gonna get carved one more time so that it produces a perfect hemisphere, but that's gonna take a while. That's, like, that's where I'm gonna put my energy and my time, and if I'm spending money on, on this milling, that's where I'm, gonna, I'm spending my money on that too, right? Like that's costing the most amount of money. So there you can see when that hemisphere finally gets perfectly carved away. And then these are the two mold halves, right? And so you can see this surface is gonna fit perfectly over here. This surface is gonna fit perfectly right there. It's a little hard to see. And then there are other areas that leave open the cavity for the actual casting. And in those moments, there's actually a lot of um, texture that's been produced by the mill that I just left. So I cast them using the exact process that you guys are learning here. Then you just fire them as if they're any other type of ceramic object. And then these are at the moment when they've been fired once. They've been glazed, like the glaze has been painted on, but they haven't been fired again a second time um, for the glaze to bond or fuse to the, the clay. But th basically the interesting thing about this was to try to figure out a way to take this scalloping, that texture, which was a byproduct of the fabrication process and let it have some meaning, right? Like the moments that needed to be smooth, they needed to be smooth. The process dictates that. These other moments, I save time and I save money by making, making it less smooth, but does that equal anything good or better besides just cheaper? 
And for this project, the test was to try to figure out, like, OK, could I use that texture to start to direct somebody's eye into the interior space of the module next to it? Because this project, if you remember, originally was designed to be a, a series of these modules that all connect one to the next, which we can kind of see here. Although they haven't been, they don't slide one to another yet because that would have scratched off the glaze. So, but here you can start to see how when they do interlock, that texture pulls your eye from the exterior surface of one to the interior surface of its neighbor. And as an architect, th this is one of the things where like I couldn't use this process and produce a hollow shell object without somehow wanting to inhabit that space. Like I wanted it to be architecture. So although I started making, I started using this process to make objects, all of a sudden I realized that I couldn't not interpret those objects as models. For me, they had to somehow still project to some larger scale of an habitation. So this is the interior of one of those modules. And that's, there you see what it looks like when it's been glazed. Are there any questions on that one so far? Like does that help explain a little bit of this process? Where's Max? Does that explain your? There would be other ways to make like um, a plaster mold, which would be where you take any kind of object. You could take just like an apple, and you could cast plaster around that apple, and then either and cut it in half and take the apple out, and then use those two mold halves to produce a cast exactly the way we are here. Or you take the apple, you build up a clay wall temporarily around one side of it, pour plaster into one side, take down the clay, you let the plaster cure, and then pour plaster into the other side, and then you basically have a two-part mold as well. Of course, depending on the complexity of, your, of the geometry of your initial object, let's say if you're trying to cast the human body, you might have something that's 200 mold parts, 200 pieces of plaster that you have to keep track of and get them put back all in the same place. And this is what um, things like the Romans when they were making plaster casts anybody during the Renaissance when they were making plaster casts, there was a whole art to figuring out exactly where all those seam lines would be and how you divvy up the body into 200, 300 different mold parts. So I'll now like move a little bit more into something that's like, okay, this is an architecture project. Like at a certain point I was like, okay, let's actually see how this could really, my investing time into learning these tools and these techniques how could it actually start to produce a different type of architecture? And this was a collaboration I did with Matthew Gillis. It was slip screen ceramic house. So like the architectural project was the ceramic house. And then a facade system that I developed was what I called uh, the slip screen. It's actually, this is a component from the slip screen. And this is actually a model of the ceramic house. So for a long time I had my office in downtown Los Angeles and I would walk around these buildings from the turn of the century, um, meaning basically from like 1880 to 1930, 1940, and they were amazing. And I would be, I mean, I would be a little bit, well, let's say awestruck that there was a point in history when there was like so much aesthetic investment in the architecture that we walk around in a daily way um, versus what we've come to know and expect from the world around us at this moment, right? Like, which is full of plenty of strip malls, mini malls, uh, you know, tilt up factories, tilt up concrete factories, whatever. So, you know, some of this was a little bit of nostalgia for an era that I actually never grew up in, but you know, there was a question in my mind, like, now that our digital tools have gotten far enough, could we actually figure out a way to get back to this level of ornamentation and just aesthetic experimentation inside of architecture, inside of something that is supposedly totally functional? Um, these are all uh, terracotta components. This would have been the predominant method of building architecture uh, after all of the big fires in the 1800s um, around the United States, especially fire code started to demand that you would actually have terracotta cladding for your building um, so it would protect uh, oftentimes what would be a steel frame. So it was, it was absolutely functional, you know, like it's there as fireproofing, but it obviously was more than just functional. Also just the, the degree of sophistication of, of color, you know, to imagine 
polychromy, that things are like exuberant and they're not just one color. It's not just steel or glass or painted stucco. Um, something that architecture had forgotten for maybe like a good 50 years. We forgot how to use color. So and all of these were produced through a process called press molding, which is basically where like you would take any one of these molds that I have here, and instead of pouring in liquid clay, you would push in um, plastic clay. So basically malleable clay, the same type of clay you would uh, throw uh, a, a mug or a cup with on a wheel. You would use that and you'd push it into a mold. It's super labor intensive. I tried this for the first time um, like a few months ago and like you've got, you have, for some of these things that I was showing, let's say for like something that big, you can see the scale of that with the people next to it or ladder in front of it. Like you've got giant molds and you've got like guys working on a factory floor just like pounding clay into these molds and you know like one arm is like way bigger than the other one. Um, this, these photos are taken from um, a place called Gladding McBean, which is outside of Sacramento. It was one of the um, main producers of architectural terracotta for this entire region, right? So almost everything we have in Los Angeles that's a terracotta building was probably produced by this place. Uh, Huell Hauser from California Gold has gone to visit. A whole bunch of people have gone to visit. It's kind of like a mecca for craft um, in the United States. These days, this is the bulk of what Gladding McBean is producing. It, they're producing basically like um, ceramic sewer pipes. And so this is also like a moment where, let's say I was saddened a little bit like when I learned this, that such an intense degree of expertise, of human knowledge and craftsmanship now is just relegated to producing something that's absolutely purely functional without any kind of aesthetic ambitions. Um, and so my, but there, there's, a, there's a truth to that. In this day and age, like, you need to have just your, the bare basics covered. And like, but the way that budgets exist inside of um, the architectural process, we have something called value engineering, which is like this phase in the architectural process when anything that isn't absolutely necessary gets eliminated. So this is like the moment of heartbreak for all architects when you've spent like months or years designing something and then the client and the, the contractor sit down and figure out like, oh yeah, we can get rid of that, we can get rid of that, we can get rid of that, we can get rid of that. And you have something left over that is kind of like a hot, you know, a sad hollow shell of what you've designed. Um, so, but I wanted to figure out, would there be a way to couple those two things, like make something that was absolutely essential functionally um, and still that would have some kind of aesthetic or ornamental ornamental ambitions. So one of the, um, I'm realizing that I might want to, I have to like keep track of how my molds are doing. Okay, I could actually use a little bit of help with this. Can I get like a couple people to just help out? Thank you. This guy seems to be doing all right. I think we're going to leave him. We don't have any danger of um, drips coming out anymore, right? I'll just pass that around. If you guys can look in there, you can kind of see what things look like at this moment. Yeah, that'd be great. So, all right, let's see. So the trick is I'm going to try pour this into there. And basically, you guys just have to like help me aim properly. I might do just fine. We can imagine that although that first cast that I did was pretty easy to pour the clay into, pretty easy to pour the clay out of it. If you look at the size of this mold that I have right now and how heavy it is, you can imagine that if I had a mold that was just twice this big, I might not be able to turn it over myself, right? Like, and at that moment, that's where I might need help from like a hydraulic lift. And basically like the only thing in the places that manufacture toilets that are automated beyond what I would do in my own studio is that they have something like a hydraulic lift to help lift the molds. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this back over. I'm actually gonna let this one just drain back 
into itself, and I'm not going to worry about the fact that it's going to leave some drip marks. You guys can all see what we have. So we're at about, we're a little bit thinner than the other one. I kind of know with this mold, we're not going to, we don't have enough time, as I said, to be able to take this thing out. It's not going to dry enough for us to be able to remove this from the mold. So we're going to see a failure here, I promise you, when we try to take this out of the mold within our two hour limit, we're going to have a failure. Um, that's good. Failures are for learning. All right, section through a terracotta building. You can see that um, these are the terracotta or the ceramic components. They're basically like, they're not, they're like a deformed surface, right? Like it almost looks like each one of those is a C shape. That's for good reason because they're actually oftentimes like you make like a, um, almost like a thick blanket of clay and you lay that into the mold and then you beat it in when, when you're doing this process press molding. Um, so it's basically, it's not quite three dimensional. It's kind of like two and a half dimensions. It occupies three dimensional space, but it's still a deformed surface. One of the interesting things about slip casting is that it always produces something that's closed as much as possible, right? Like it, it's a vessel no matter what. It starts as a vessel um, because it, whatever your mold is, it has to hold the liquid of the clay. So it could be an open vessel or a closed vessel, but it is a vessel. And so one of the things I was trying to do was to just say, okay, like if I have a vessel and I wanted to, let, let's say if I had a facade and instead of producing all these ceramic modules through press molding, which is the old way of doing it, if I wanted to do it through slip casting, could every single module on that facade become a vessel and therefore become functional somehow? Um, and of course I have you know, this example in my head of something that is produced through slip casting that's a vessel and is like absolutely functional. Um, it's super complex in its form because it needs to be to, to function uh, the way we have to, the way we need it to. So then I was trying to figure out, okay, okay, if I had vessels that would cover a facade, what would be all the different things that they could do? So you could imagine like some of those uh, components could be full of water. They could absorb heat over the course of the day and radiate that heat at night. Um, we could have something where if you had a porous clay body, uh, does anybody... Does anybody know chia pets? Has anybody ever seen a chia pet? Like, if you think about the way a chia pet works, the reason a chia pet works, sorry, I don't have a slide of a chia pet, um, is that there's, a, it's like a hollow clay animal or whatever. You fill it full of water, and the water percolates through the clay, so it reaches the exterior, and then you can grow plants on the exterior of it, right? Like, so all that to say is that you can have, um, Clay can actually absorb and then dissipate water on the other side, right? If you get a porous type of clay. Which means that you could also, as that water evaporates out of the clay, if wind moves past it, it's going to cool that wind. So you could actually use these modules for evaporative cooling. And you could start to cool the spaces around, around the modules. And then another possibility was like just planting, using each one of these modules as planters, because it could just simply be a pot. And you could almost place thousands of plots place thousands of pots on a building facade. Um, these were the two that I decided to prototype in my studio. Uh, so the air cooling module through, um, through evaporative cooling, and then the green wall. And then I just basically tried to figure out a way that, given, given those functions, then there was just a question of geometry. How could I start to arrange all um, these modules so that they could cover a surface that wasn't simply flat. You know, if one of the things that when we walk around downtown Los Angeles or any of the buildings from that time period that I showed earlier from the turn of the century, they're all pretty much flat facades. Um, would there be a way to, to question that? Like, could we actually have facades that were more voluptuous, curved, whatever, complex, complexly curved surfaces? Um, and then there's a trick to figure out how you would have all of these modules attach and fasten um, and just connect seamlessly from one to the next. So basically in, in my design, there was a set of um, basically seven different angles and I would use one, I, this was a two part mold, and I would use one half of, of my mold to produce the angle and the other half to produce the function. And I guess I have a diagram of that, right? So one side of this, 
this side right here dictates the geometry, which you can kind of see right there. However complex this thing looks this way, if we look at it in this direction, it's a really simple cut on both sides. And, and you can track those because there's only seven options. So it means I would have seven molds on this side, mold parts, and then I would have however many different functions I wanted on this side. And I could take the geometry side of the mold and the function side of the mold and put them together and produce my, my module there. So this is the one that you guys just saw. This was the one that kind of operates both depending on how you cut it in post-production after it's been cast. This can work either for evaporative cooling or for um, plants. So in there you can kind of get an idea of what it would look like if it were aggregated across uh, a building facade. So these, these moments right there, you would basically have water moving through and then in these areas that water evaporates through the clay body and then as wind passes through, it cools the spaces on the other side. So these were the models, uh, the modules that I prototyped. These were actually fired here um, at, uh, in the ceramics department over there. And then this is a test as to how they would start to, to aggregate. And then the idea would also be similar to that first project that I showed you, Tectonic Horizons. How would I take this scalloping or this texture and try to figure out a way to do something functional with it? So in this case, this is actually trying to take, if it were to rain, it's trying to capture that rainwater and guide it across the exterior of the module into moments where, it would, where it could, the water could pass from the exterior to the interior. And then it would kind of like be contained inside the loop um, of, of, uh, of this larger process going on in the wall. So in terms of all the different types of modules that I could produce, then you can see like, okay, if I've got my evaporative cooling modules, the one that I prototyped, this was a test to find out how it might align with the architecture. So in this case, the evap this, it's a little bit hard to see, but this curves in one direction, but also in the other direction. So it's kind of like a, a belly. And this would be in shade, and this would be in the sun. So in this case, I've got my solar water heater modules on the top of that belly so that they're full on facing the sun. I've got my evaporative cooling modules on the underside of this. This would make perfect sense in a place, in a dry, arid climate like Los Angeles, where we need to figure out a way to both cool and heat depending on the time of the day, right? Um, there are another set of modules that I, w I was working on uh, that I didn't prototype that were about filtering gray water so you could have water come off the roof and filter it through your modules because there's another clay body that actually purifies water as the water passes through. In that case, these would need to be vertically arranged so that water could move through each one of them and get cleaner and cleaner by the time it gets to the bottom. All this to say, like, there is a logic as to where those different modules, the different performance types or functioning modules start to arrange themselves naturally on an architectural surface. Which then, when we also think about color and about ref reflectivity, whether it's matte or whether it's reflective, like the the areas that are in that are for um, passive cooling, it has to be a porous clay body. You can't glaze it because when you glaze it, that seals the water in. So this just indicates that there would these would be areas that are um, the most porous and the most matte, the least reflective. Um, where there are other areas around here that could be as reflective as I want, they could be any color. Um, this is a color diagram again. These areas would need to be exactly the same color as the clay body that I'm casting with. Whereas these areas up on top actually want to be as dark as possible because they want to absorb as much sunlight as possible. So I would glaze those in a really dark color. I chose green because I like green. Um, but the only important thing is that they're dark, right? Dark and matte. So they absorb as much sunlight as possible. And then there was kind of like a simple process that actually rel um, parallels to a certain extent the same way those buildings that I was interested in downtown Los Angeles from the turn of the century, the way they work, which is that there's a structure which is made of concrete and steel, and then there's basically kind of like a skin, which is ceramic, which is placed on top of that. Or in this case, I almost imagined it as being draped on top of the structure. So basically then, this is their architecture <coughs> um, proposal. Again, you can see here are the areas where you would have passive cooling. So this is kind of like an outdoor patio area that would be naturally cooled by evaporative cooling. Then in some of these areas over here are where we have um, the, the hot water um, 
passive heating systems. And again, the idea was to produce something that had an aesthetics to it that was totally dictated by the function of all of these units, right? Like somebody couldn't just say, you know what, like we need to change the color scheme on here, right? Like, or you know what, we just need to get rid of the colors, right? Like, because in a way, in, cer in certain cases, they only work because of the color that they are. Uh, just This was basically, a, I call it the ceramic house, but it was basically a conference, a live-in conference facility or basically where people would stay for, for the space of like a week. And so there needed to be um, residential units as well as uh, larger um, uh, uh, basically conference rooms and then uh, an auditorium. Uh, and just one more view. And then there were some other like just ways to kind of visualize like, okay, this is... This is where we would take the cool air from the outside and cool at least this area in here. It would heat up and then we'd vent it out. So these are, at this point in architecture, you know, we, we all need to be thinking about um, this way of working with the environment naturally instead of always trying to just air condition and heat everything, right? The only thing different about this project is that it was trying to do it as much as possible through these ceramic components. Any questions on that project? That one kind of makes sense. So I'm kind of like expanding more and more further outside of what would be considered either traditional ceramic work or traditional architecture. Um, but I'll, just a little um, digression into some of the work that I've been doing at Woodbury with my students. I've started a, um, an institute called the Institute for Material Ecologies, so time. Uh, and one of the classes that I did with them was basically taking those exact same techniques that I did with the ceramic house and trying to figure out like how we would do that with campus installations. So, but really getting into a little bit more of the nitty gritty of um, connection details. So thinking through how one module connects to another one. Um, this was a project that used kind of a similar glaze to the one that I had been working on. And that particular glaze, when you layer it on thick, it starts to turn black and, ref and almost more matte rather than green and reflective. Uh, but then they basically were trying to figure out how to produce as much variation with as few different component types as possible. So there were a total of three different component types that then weave together to produce this screen that conceivably could be the size of a 80-story office tower or something like that. Um, and the students built it at full scale only a portion of it, right? So this is an uh, installation on campus. It's one-to-one -one scale, but obviously we don't have an 80-story building on our campus, and the students didn't have enough time in 15 weeks. Um, so we built as much of it as we could. But it operates in exactly the same way it would if this were an office tower. And one of the challenges was to figure out how to produce as much depth in something that's effectively still basically a facade, but could it contain as many small little microspaces inside of it as possible. This is a different project that was actually uh, directly addressing the idea of having a, a grow wall or some, something where each one of these modules could have water that moves through, as you see in the first diagram, um, that would basically nourish plant life, uh, which you can see here. This was a project that was also trying to contain space, sometimes uh, not between the modules, but between the components that made up one module. So you can kind of see, yeah, you can kind of see inside there that sometimes there are these wafers that basically hold space inside of them. Um, and another one, this one basically tried to produce as much variation as possible. This was like produced with a hexagonal six-part mold, or if you can imagine a hexagon, and it's got like these six pie-shaped pie plaster wedges. You could swap those wedges with, they had a set of about maybe 30 different pie-shaped wedges that they could keep on recombining to produce all of these different uh, modules. So there's no module that ever repeats twice. They, they're all similar, right? Like they're all basically roughly the same size, but they're all unique. And they all have slightly different spaces inside of them. Um, so at a certain point, I kind of realized that I should take stock of what, I was, what was I really learning and what was the relationship between the work that I had been doing with clay and the other work that I had been doing in a more, let's say, standard um, design office way. And this 
there was a good opportunity for this, which is that I had, um, like, let's say, the first retrospective exhibition of the work of my office, Radical Craft. And so the first idea was to figure out, like, okay, what is this feedback and scale between object making and between architectural proposal? And as well, it was kind of like a self-assessment, right? Like, okay, like, what am I learning inside this process? So this was the, the gallery exhibition. I did the, the exhibition design for this, which was like very straightforward. Um, basically, anything that's on a shelf is an object, and anything that's on the wall is a proposal, right? Uh, an image of um, a proposal that may or may not have been built. And then the question would be, do the objects on the shelves start to inform the work on the wall and vice versa. So that you know, very simple shelf started to deform according to which types of objects were sitting on it. And sometimes there was like a very direct correlation between um, the kind of object work and the proposal work. Um, in this case, there was an obvious relationship between, let's say, the design of the ceramic house and then the design of the slips um, slip screen modules which were meant to populate uh, the house. And then in other cases, there were things that were a little bit more like, let's say, a surprise for myself. Like, okay, like here was an, I had done an installation um, on Hollywood Boulevard, and then it seemed to actually be learning from work that I'd been doing at the scale of ceramics that uh, because I was working in the ceramic material, I also started to look to dishware and things like decals and the decorative, the decorative work that. Um, that happens inside of dishware. And it was clear that it maybe started to have uh, an impact on just the patterning and um, the ornamental uh, motifs that I was using inside this uh, installation. And then there were some that were even, let's say, more of a surprise, certainly in terms of scale, where in this case, this was like um, a proposal for a high-speed rail station um, in the San Fernando Valley which was obviously informed by that Tectonic Horizons project that I showed you guys first, right? Like just some of the, the shapes that were starting to emerge from the work that I was doing with ceramics clearly was having an impact on much larger um, architectural proposals. Uh, and even this one, which was that World Sustainability Center that I showed you, obviously also has just formal affinities um, to some of the object making. So at that point then, I think like I started to also try to figure out a way to have not just formal um, influence from the ceramic work into the, the design work, but to try to figure out a way to have much more, to learn from clay beyond just form making, I guess, would, would be a way of saying it. Um, and so this project uh, was a competition for a market hall in Istanbul, Turkey. And it's basically, if you know Istanbul at all, it's like right around here. It's in a pretty um, vibrant neighborhood that is also at the moment of being gentrified just like all these other major cities across the world um, where high rise hotels are being put in that are just like concrete slab after concrete slab. Um, this is kind of what it looks like now and this was the site for the competition. So uh, the site required, a, or the project brief required a certain amount of parking and me and my collaborators knew that immediately if you just were to deal with the parking in terms of just like putting in either underground parking or above ground parking, if it's just slabs of concrete, like it feeds into exactly the same developer mentality that, that is already happening um, in Istanbul. And we were trying to push against that in some way. Because of course, um, that model treats the earth as if it's just there for development or exploitation, right? Like if you can just dig up the earth and put in concrete slabs and throw in parking, and you don't really have to think about the earth that you're digging up, life is easy, right? Like then you can just put up a 10-story condo and make some, make some bucks off it. Um, we are actually trying to figure out a way to really be much more sensitive to the particular earth that is in Istanbul, which Istanbul being a city that's thousands of years old, um, part of the... Roman Empire in a certain way. Um, we also, we looked at this mountain in Rome, it's called Monte Testaccio, um, which this mountain is basically entirely man-made. It was man-made about 2,000 years ago. And it, it basically happened when 
all of the Roman ships that were coming in from all over the Roman Empire, they were bringing basically olive oil from everywhere in the Roman Empire. And every time one of the vessels, they were called amphora, any time one of those vessels would break on the journey and it would arrive here in Rome, they would basically cut it in half and stack it. And they just kept on stacking it and stacking it and stacking it. And over hundreds of years, it stacked this high, basically, right? So in a way, it's like the first garbage dump, like the first organized garbage dump, but it's also like the first material archive that turns into landscape um, because it, it indexes everything that was being imported to Rome from everywhere in the, in the empire. So this is the, way it, this is the way it looks when you're walking across the mountain right now. It's just shards of um, clay. If you were to cut a section or carve away a little bit of that hill, you see that it's, it's very neatly organized, which means that archaeologists have a really easy time of just categorizing things because it's, in a way it's already been categorized for them. They can find out exactly you know, what the extents of the Roman Empire were because they can track the ceramic uh, materials from here to wherever they came from. If it's Spain, if it's Northern Africa, whatever, they can actually look at the earth inside of these shards and track it backwards. And now it's like a great place for wine bars because like basically the mountain holds in the, the exact temperature that you need to chill wine. So this is basically, if you're gonna go out for a drink in Rome, this is where you're gonna go. Um, but we were trying to figure out like, okay, the minute we start to dig in the earth in Istanbul, which is a city with an, an equal level of history and also an equally um, intact archive inside the earth, right? Like the minute you dig, you hit some kind of historical artifact. Um, that's for both Rome and for Istanbul. So we started to imagine like what would be all the things that we would hit if we just started to dig. And then we had this kind of, um, let's say there was, this was a project in Istanbul where there was, there was like this holdout, there was like this big development that was happening and then there was this like this one um, stubborn person who wouldn't sell their house, right? Like, and so the whole development had to move forward with this kind of like thorn in its side, right? Like with this pee under the mattress. Um, and of, of course it like affects everything that comes after that, right? And so we were trying to figure out how could our project operate in this way somehow. It would preserve, I mean, there's even something beautiful about the way this person's belligerence, like their refusal to sell to some big developer, actually then preserves a certain amount of the earth in the city. Um, so. Our challenge was how could we do something like that and still have it be inhabited? So we decided, okay, the way that we're gonna make our marketplace is not to build some structure above ground, but to excavate, carve out all of these chunks from below ground, lift them up and keep them intact, like basically preserve them as, as if they were some kind of museum piece, knowing that there actually would be museum pieces inside there because there's so many historical artifacts of significance. And then we would stack them on the side of the site so that we would have like this extra building that was solid, but it was made up of all of these artifacts. So it would become like this um, museum of the earth next to uh, this basically below ground um, marketplace. So this is the plan view from, of the lower level of the marketplace. And then this is a plan of basically that solid building, and then we also had one extra building that we left on the site. Um, so the idea then also was that the shape of this thing, of th this is our, our one building that we created out of, out of dirt, out of earth. We basically mimic the shape of the building right next to it as a way of just kind of like giving some historical significance to something that people would otherwise ignore. So again, you can see there's this historical building next to it, and we, we just kind of doubled it. So that's why we call the project the Dirt Doppelganger, like the doppelganger, the, the double, um, but then something that's made solid and made out of earth. And of course, I, you know, like this is something that also comes from a process and a lifetime almost of, not a lifetime, 10 years of like working with casting, you know, like that in a way that has started to um, influence my brain to the point where like, in a way, I can believe that it's uh, the easiest solution is to just produce something that exists in the world already, right? Like instead of trying to figure out what shape this building is going to be, we, we know what volume the building is going to be because 
that is dictated by how much we're excavating out of the earth. But the shape of it, instead of really trying to like completely design that from scratch, the shape of it just comes from something that already exists. So this is a view from the marketplace looking back at that, um, that kind of earthen archive, or almost like a museum of the earth, and then all the artifacts that go with that. This is just, again, pointing out like that was that building, the existing building that we basically mimicked or doubled. Uh, so that, that is like, you can see here, the existing building and then our, our duplicate of it. So the other thing is that like it starts to show, like you can imagine um, as our building potentially erodes over time, since it's made out of earth, it would somehow index or make obvious the types, um, the difference between our building and the building next door. So it starts to register time and change over time. And speaking of time, um, so then one other way, like if part of what um, we're doing at Woodbury in the Institute of Material Ecologies is just trying to figure out how to make um, components for standard buildings that are produced using non-standard building materials, so clay would be one, but there are other types of materials that we're investigating. I think one of the other things that we're trying to do is to figure out like how these materials connect us to larger systems, um, to systems that might be ecological or cultural or historical. And so this is a um, studio that I've run a couple times called Mineral Mannerisms, Architectural Geology and Landscape. And one of the questions is like, how can we, th number one, think about material behavior? So how does working at the scale of the object actually start to teach us about similar processes that are happening at vastly different scales? So in this case, this is a kind of beautiful study. This was done in the 1840s by a geologist who was also like a, a, a woodworker. And so he was testing, trying to figure out the way tectonic fault lines work um, just through woodworking. And they're, they're kind of these exquisite objects um, which start to get more and more complex, right? And you can imagine that at a certain point, like he's just, let's say initially, he's probably just representing plate tectonics that he sees happening at another scale. But at a certain point, there's something that he learns through woodwork, woodworking techniques that probably leads to some kind of discovery that he would have never thought would be possible at the scale of plate tectonics, right? At the scale of the globe. So I think this is what we're trying to do, like to try to figure out a way that there's this connection across scales with material that if you learn it at the scale of craft, at the scale of your desk, you can actually start to make predictions or design proposals that you wouldn't otherwise do at a much larger scale. Um, and then also it starts to connect us to earlier moments in history simply by craft traditions that, that go along with these, um, these materials. So this is, um, this is like a very famous type of um, ceramic object that basically comes from the start of the Industrial Revolution in the, um, in the late 1700s um, from mice in Germany. And they basically invented a way of like having large scale industrial processes with a lot of intricate detail, which otherwise you would always have to have somebody do this by hand. But some of my students were researching just the geology around that area in Germany. So this is um, a geological map of Meissen. And then taking that and just trying to figure out like, okay, how would we produce that same map or some, some feeling of the, that pattern inside of Illustrator, first of all. And then afterwards, how would we produce that pattern materially through slip casting? And so you can see the, the landscape, the kind of geological landscape that the student was able to produce. And we can learn one thing here, right? Um, we can learn another thing when we start to take what's almost like a geological section through that object that, again, we produce right at our desk. Now, of course, not all of these patterns reproduce themselves exactly at other scales, right? Like some things are totally dependent upon gravity operating one way at one scale and differently at another scale. But there still are things that you can learn as you move across scale um, in terms of the way one, one material might behave. So these are just a series of different um, explorations trying to understand through digital and material craft techniques how we could make speculative proposals across the scale of landscape. 
testing erosion patterns, um, testing the movement of one heavier material with a lighter material that moves across it. And then also, again, just looking at um, traditions that exist inside of clay, like delftware, and the, the particular uh, combination of blue and white glaze. So and then this is a project that my students are currently working on, which is um, our site is right across the street from the Puente Hills landfill. Has ever, anybody ever been to, seen the Puente Hills landfill? I don't know if you've ever driven past it. Yeah, I think this is the, it's like the 60 is like, I think that's the 60 right here. Um, and this is like the city of industry right here. So it's this moment where until five years ago, this was the largest active landfill in the United States. Um, the city of industry is, Number one, it's where we get all of our clay in Southern, Southern California. There's a place called Laguna Clay right here. And so it was a way for us as designers to recognize where our building materials are coming from and where they're going to, right? Like that as architects, as designers, we no longer have the luxury of assuming that the thing that we design um, just stays there forever, right? Like we have to think where those materials come from and where they go to after the building is disassembled, changed, whatever. So, yeah, it was just closed and it's going to become a park. Um, but the students are working on, at the moment, they're just starting to move into architectural proposals. But they started just working with um, 3D printing and clay and doing experimentations, again, at a kind of a craft scale. Then trying to figure out like, how those might start to lead to potentially architectural forms and uses that we haven't seen up until now. And then slowly, they start to get more and more towards something that might feel like architecture. So in this one student's project, you can see something that's meant to look very clearly like geology, like, like rock or stone. But then when you open it up, it actually starts to hold space inside of it. Uh, this, one, this one was cast using the process that you guys already know how to do. This one was 3D printed with clay and then glazed afterwards. And then this was 3D printed as well. And this starts to look more and more like architecture. Uh, not necessarily typical of standard architecture, but architecture. OK. So let me take a quick break and check on. So OK. So at this point, I've got stuff that's almost starting to flake off of my mold. Let's pass that around. It's not the biggest sample, but you know what? Oh, can you guys see this here? You see how it's starting to crack? Right down there, can you guys see these cracks? So we know already that somehow the process is working, right? Like the plaster is drying the clay. It's drying it enough that it's cracking. Um, one of the great things about the way that plaster and clay work together is that it's super easy. It's super easy to take your clay cast out of your plaster mold because the clay shrinks while it's in the mold, right? So in almost other, all other forms of mold making, one of the things that you always, one of the biggest problems is getting the cast out of the mold, right? And you'll see that in a lot of things that have been produced using a mold making process, there's a draft angle to them. I assume like all the industrial designers know about draft angles. They exist in almost any cast product or any product that's been vacuum formed or anything that uses a mold. With clay, we do have to worry about that to a certain extent. If we have a deep draw, we might actually have to have a draft angle. Um, but by and large, for a relatively simple form like this, it's going to shrink, and it makes it easy for it to pop out, right? Now, if I were to take this, if I had designed this slightly differently, and I had like almost like a crescent moon in here instead of a full moon, you can imagine that then I would basically have like a peninsula of plaster, like a projection or a, like a protuberance of plaster. If this is the plaster here, and this is my clay, as the clay shrinks, it starts to grab onto the plaster, right? Like, that's where it starts to become really difficult 
in this process. It can be really easy if you basically have bowl-like forms, but the minute you have something that has a divot or an indentation on it, that the clay cast can start to lock on the plaster mold. So when I'm designing molds, these are like all the things you have to think of. How do your registration marks line up? How do you anticipate whether or not you need a draft angle? How do you think about um, even like where does my where does my liquid start to pool? So remember, you guys, I I didn't let this one drain properly, so I've still got like a little bit of clay that's dripping down. I don't know how many of you guys can see that there. That little bit of clay right there. All these things can be anticipated when you're designing um, your molds. So the two molds that we have there are, um, are for this project called Isochronic Mountain. It's the last project I'll show, but it's a somewhat in-depth project that has a whole bunch of different facets. Um, and it, it takes this idea of earthen intelligence and I think takes it out to an even more abstract scale in that it doesn't necessarily, it's not an architectural proposal, it's not just a simple object, it's something that's wrapped up in a lot of other cultural issues that are, um, that are at play right now in the world. And so this, this project was initiated um, in 2013. I was on a residency in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it was right at this moment that the, the first day I arrived when I got off the plane, there was the first day of some massive strikes, right? Like basically the whole country went on strike. Um, it started in Sao Paulo. And it started because um, the, the price of the metro, of the subways, went up by something like 14 cents or something like that, right? So not a huge amount to us, um, but you can imagine to people living in Sao Paulo who are, you know, have a very low salary, 14 cents could be a huge amount, and it might be the difference between them making it to work and not making it to work. Um, so again, like massive protest, everybody took to the street. The interesting thing about it was that um, while I was doing archival research, one of the reasons I was, I was there kind of like researching two different things. One was the informal settlements of the favelas. It's kind of like a, a large scale urban issue, but it's something that also deals with like just the way people construct their own house. And then also this issue of like urban transportation. So of course I was very interested when there was this giant strike that, had, that was in a way caused by problematic infrastructure. Um, and one of the things that I discovered when I, was, when I went to go visit the Museum of Transportation, because that's just one of the things I do, um, was this amazing map called an isochronic map. Has anybody ever heard of an isochronic map before? Can anybody guess what isochronic would be? Chronic, anybody know what chronic means? Has a couple different meanings. What's that? Something dealing with time, basically, like a chronos, right? So chronic, um, basically just meaning that it has something to do with time or duration, right? Iso, if you think of like an isosceles triangle, does anybody remember which triangle is an isosceles triangle? One with two equal lengths, right? So iso meaning equal, chronos, chronic meaning time, so equal segments of time. So basically, if you think about this map right here, however far this distance is geographically, temporarily, in terms of time, these are the same, meaning that this is a map that basically uh, tracks how long it takes to move through the United States by train in 1857. So if you start in New York, it takes you one day to get to here. It takes you two days to get to here. It takes you three days to get to here. By the time you get over here, it starts counting in weeks, right? So it takes six weeks to get to some place in the, in the Rockies. Well, I guess basically to um, almost to the Grand Canyon, right? It's not just a way of mapping the speed of transportation. It's also about mapping um, the extent of infrastructure, right? Like part of this is because of the lack of rail ra railways um, heading into the West, not just because of how fast they move. This is another great one, like of course, from the British perspective of London, how, how long it takes to get to everywhere in the world um, from London. So, I mean, you know, the kind of amazing thing is you start to discover that um, certain parts of the United States are just like much less accessible than 
other parts like where you'd probably have to go travel here, like across all of Europe to get to here. Maybe you can go by ship through the Mediterranean all the way around, but then you're still heading by land to get to this, this moment right here. That's still easier to get to than the United States um, for similar reasons, because you have to take a boat and then a train and then something and then this, something else. So this really amazing map from 1939 documented all of the tram lines in Sao Paulo. And of the first thing that struck me was that there's no trams in Sao Paulo. Where did all these trams go? And of course, coming from Los Angeles, I don't know, how, how many people know about the Pacific Electric red car line? Is that something that you guys know about already? Like just raise your hand if you've heard of it. Pacific Electric red car line. So you know that all of Los Angeles and everything around Los Angeles, all the way down to Long Beach, beyond, used to be connected by rail, right? Like by rail for people, right? Passenger rail, just streetcars, right? Like, so we always think of Los Angeles as being sprawling because of freeways, but it's not. It's sprawling because of a really incredibly good network of public transportation, right? Like exactly the thing that we miss right now is exactly the thing that built Los Angeles hundreds of years ago. Um, or basically just like 150 years ago. So Sao Paulo was exactly the same way. There was a decision made in Sao Paulo, the same way there was in Los Angeles, to take a really good public transportation system and dismantle it, right? And that was a conscious decision done on the part of city planners, but done on the part of the population as well, the same way it was in the United States. In a way, a huge amount of the world thought that the car was going to save everything, right? Like, Everybody would have personal freedom. There would be no reason to have public transportation anymore, right? Like, who wants to sit on a crowded bus with other people? Um, so this project basically like tried to figure out how do we document what was lost in that decision to dismantle public transportation, to dismantle an entire system, right? So it first of all takes something which is two-dimensional and intentionally misreads it as something that's three-dimensional. Architects always work with topographic maps. So we, whenever we look at a map like this, we imagine this as lines of topography, not necessarily as lines of time. So basically, I rebuilt that, that map as if it were a topographic model. So you guys have probably all seen topographic models like this. Like if you ever go to a national park, this one is from, I think, Mount McKinley in Alaska. So you, know, you can kind of like walk over, look at the map, put your finger on where you are, and then put your finger on where you want to go. And so what I wanted to do was produce something that would accurately represent the difficulty of moving through the city depending on where you live. So in this case, if I want to get to the center of Sao Paulo and I live here, I just, with this modeling technique, I count the number of steps I have to go up, and that tells me how many minutes, right? So if I have to go up five steps, it takes me five minutes by public transportation. If I live here, which is basically the same distance from downtown, it takes me twice as long to get there, right? So this is an area that has really good access to downtown, and this is an area that has really poor access. You can see this is, there's like a, a line here that represents a tram line. So basically what's happening here is like, there's this tram line that moves through the city, stops here, and then people walk the rest of the way. So that's why it starts to cascade down. There's like really fast, movement here, and then as it moves downhill, that equals slower and slower movement. So it's a map of time almost as if it's lava. Um, there's kind of like this famous example. Um, this is by Michelangelo in Florence. This is called the Laurentian Staircase, which is always thought of in the same way. It's like the stairs are almost like lava. When they move past the balustrade, they like spread out into the vestibule in front of them. And so I was interested in trying to figure out how time also acted like lava. Here you can see, um, again, one of these tram lines. This big cut through the city is a train line. So it's something that actually carves the city up and makes it less accessible instead of more accessible because you can't cross those tracks except at a bridge. So you can see there's a bridge here, there's a bridge there, there's a bridge there. Because we can tell that like, as somebody takes a tram, steps off the tram, walks across the bridge, then they head in this direction or this direction, and so time kind of like spills out. It constricts at the bridge, and then it spills out on the other side of the bridge. So uh, that was for Sao Paulo in 1939. I wanted to try to figure out what Sao Paulo would look like in 2013. 
<laughs> this is one way that Sao Paulo looks like, right? Uh, but the other way was, was to figure out what, what is the experience of Sao Paulo in 2013? And of course then like, there are all these issues wrapped up in there like what is the political landscape that starts to produce what I would call a landscape of inequity? Like I was trying to represent the landscape of inequity like who gets to have access to the city and who doesn't? Who has an uphill climb to their job and who has an easy way of getting um, to downtown? This was an online um, applet called uh, Mapnificent, which is still online. You guys can check it out. In all these different cities, you can kind of like drop a pin and then it'll tell you how far you can travel in 10 minutes by tr public transportation, by 20 minutes, by 50 minutes, by 100 minutes, so you can see how much of the city becomes accessible to you over time. And even here you can see this little archipelago is because there's like a subway system that lets you pop out right here at this moment and then head in any direction. So different from a bus or a tram, the minute you start to have, um, you start to have subways, there are certain moments in the city where like you can go faster, farther than if you were to go halfway between two subway stops, basically, right? Like, it's easier to get to a subway stop that's further away than it is to get to the, the, somebody's house that's in between two subway stops. So this is basically the two molds that, that we've been looking at right there. That's basically a cast, or this one is, wherever it went. This one is a cast of Sao Paulo in 1939, and, and then this is a cast of Sao Paulo in 2013. And what I did was I tried to keep the start points the same in a way to represent the erosion of infrastructure that would happen between the past and the present. The reason being um, that in the past, it would never take longer than 45 minutes to move from one side of the city to the other. Nowadays, people spend up to four hours moving from the center of town to their house, or vice versa, from their house to their work in the morning. Um, you can see that the city has gotten larger, so let's say this would be the extent of the city in the past, which is the same as this right here. So the city has gotten like that much larger. The real problem is not that the city has gotten larger, but the, the real problem is that the city dismantled its infrastructure, right? So the city has become you know, according to technological progress, what we thought was technological pro progress, the car, the city has become more and more difficult to move through. And right at the moment that it was getting larger is exactly at the moment that there was a disinvestment in infrastructure. So I am then also interested in these as basically like three-dimensional graphs, but also as a way to invent um, a landscape that is some ways more accurate than the landscape of the existing city. So I'm interested in them as almost like picturesque landscapes. And Sao Paulo and Rio almost have like a similar competition as like Los Angeles and San Francisco. Like Rio and San Francisco are the pretty places, you know, and like Sao, Sao Paulo and Los Angeles are like, you know, just the kind of like gritty places. Um, Rio has all this amazing topography. Sao Paulo doesn't, you know, it's just, it's just like development. Um, so I was interested in, in somehow proposing like a landscape, a different landscape for Sao Paulo. So this was like a series of, of copper plate etchings that I did to try to present that landscape, not just as data, but also as something, again, that would be like experiential. Um, has anybody ever done copper plate etchings before? It's kind of an amazing process. I mean, just like any of these techniques, um, just the amount of detail, the amount of work that goes into it, but the amount of precision that you can get out of it, and then the amount of variation that happens because of the materials, like literally the way ink starts to fill in gaps um, and copper, offers something that you, again, couldn't predict, the same way that with slip casting, you can only predict so much. Um, this was then a version of contemporary Sao Paulo that was produced via um, a digital model, through Illustrator, and then through basically digitally etching on a copper plate. So in my, in basically all of my work, I'm always trying to figure out ways to move between traditional techniques and then also um, 
digital contemporary techniques. So the last kind of tail end of this project is um, where I'm, I've, I've now been trying to apply this same way of looking at the city and its infrastructure to other cities around the world, and that starts with Buffalo. Um, in a way, because Buffalo had another extreme situation where it had, at its time, basically like the second best transit system next to um, Washington, D.C. per capita, right? Like meaning that New York has probably always had more um, subways, but those cities had more subways per person, right? So in a way, better access. Um, but uh, in 1950, they had the last streetcar ride, which was something that was celebrated in the city. Like there were invitations sent out for like a black tie affair, like come ride the last streetcar in Buffalo. Um, this is like a letter from the president of the Niagara Frontier Transit System. And then this is people excited to ride the subway or the, you know, the tram lines for the, the last time. Like rest in peace. We don't need tram lines anymore. We have cars and buses now. Um, you know, of course, it's like it's almost tragic to like see an image like this at a moment when every city across the globe, and especially in the United States, is trying their hardest to build back their infrastructure systems in terms of public transit, right? Like LA is doing a better job than most cities in the world because we build a new subway line like every two years or something like that. Let's say there's probably not any other cities in the United States that are building transit infrastructure at that rate. So LA has a long way to go. We have a long way to catch up because we dismantled a, a, our entire system, whereas other cities kept portions of theirs. Um, but we're actually doing a good job of building right now. But it's amazing to just kind of see that, um, that hubris, that, that pride, and just um, complete conviction that this is the right decision to get rid of these. So just a reminder, right? Like this is the public transit network in Los Angeles under the Pacific Electric Railway. Um, you know, all the way down to Long Beach, but way beyond, you know, all the way down to Newport, Balboa, everything networked by public transit, all the way out to San Bernardino. Um, of course, we know that when these types of publicly funded infrastructural systems are dismantled, it often hits certain groups harder than others, right? So Buffalo was like one place to really take a look at that. What does it mean when somebody has to um, take a bus in instead of drive a car? Um, you can see that like there's only tw basically one quarter of the, the city lives within easy reach of public transportation, right? Like, and, and there's barely any jobs that are within easy reach of public transportation. What does that end up meaning? Like the, the big takeaway is people who use public transit earn half as much as those who drive a car, right? Like that's significant. Now there's, what we don't know from that data is what direction the, co the cause and effect runs in. Do people earn less money because they take public transportation? Or do people take public trans transportation because they earn less money, right? Like, but in a way, it doesn't matter. We know that there's that connection. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do and when I talk about earth and intelligence is how do these landscape and earth and metaphors help us understand issues that are at play in the city, at play in culture in a much larger way. So again, this idea of erosion, we understand that word. Um, the thing about erosion is that it's not just that material disappears, right? Like material moves from one place to another. This is, um, this is the Tiber River Delta on the coast of Italy where Basically, the, you know, the country of Italy is like slowly turning itself inside out. As the mountains erode, the coastline grows, right? So material moves from here to here, and it slowly gets added to the coastline at the moment just west of Rome. So basically, like, there's this question then. When we take support or funding away from one place, it means it's going somewhere else, right? Again, it doesn't just disappear. There's some idea of... Um, reciprocity or repercussions that we have to be thinking about. So right now, the work that's, that I'm doing so far for Buffalo is to first get like very accurate data about the transportation systems. And so this is the isochronic map um, that I've produced that comes directly from GIS data. So that's uh, geo, it's geographical information systems. Um, and you can see like this is one minute of time traveled. So you can see 
where the quick moving parts of the city are and then where the slower moving parts of the city are, right? So you can start to understand who has better access to transit. Which again is about this idea of like trying to give shape to something that doesn't exist. It's a lack, right? Like how do you start to like define absence? So I'm, I'm working on building these same models now for Buffalo. Um, one of the things that matters, of course, is what time of the day you take a look at the transportation system. So at 6 a.m. in the city, you can see that a lot of areas are pretty high up, um, whereas at 12 p.m. on a Saturday on the weekend, certain parts of the city start to get cut away from having e easy access to downtown. Um, and then obviously at something like almost midnight on a weeknight, large portions of the city just get cut away, right? Like they're, they're very distant from downtown. And then one of the main goals for this next phase was to produce um, a ceramic model that would be larger than the ones that you've seen here, just so I could have better resolution so people could actually really find where they live um, on this, this model. And this, basically I broke it I had to break up that geometry into something about like 13 components. Um, these are the ones that are press molded, the process that I was talking about for the um, uh, buildings from the turn of the century. So this is basically where you pack in plastic or malleable clay. And then this is what you get. So it doesn't map the mold as precisely as the slip casting does. You can see here that there's kind of like these gaps or these fissures between one ball of clay that's been thrown in there and another ball of clay. Um, but of course, it actually starts to produce something that feels a little bit more geological. So it was part of the process that I was actually quite happy with. Um, there's also all of these steps going back to Max's first question of the day, how do you produce these plaster molds? The molds were, the pieces were all mostly about this big, the ceramic pieces, sometimes as big as like this big the molds had to be larger than that, right? So the molds would get to be quite large. They weren't something that I could just fabricate on the digital mill because you simply can't fit in that much material into the digital mill. So I had to mill pieces of foam and then stack them, which you see here. So that's foam that's been laminated, um, that was milled, and then the plaster was cast into that. But it produces, the molds that it produced were kind of actually amazing objects just unto themselves. So ultimately, I'll be exhibiting both the molds and the, the cast sculpture or model. This is the set of all the molds. And it does something weird between being some, something like landscape, something like architecture. And then this is the actual set of all the different components that add up to make the cast. So this is what this is basically what Buffalo looks like in terms of your temporal experience of moving through Buffalo. So things, you know, I know this model well enough to know that this little butte and that little plateau are caused by the metro line that runs along that ridge. And then each one of these is a metro station. The next job is for me to help the public figure out a way that they can actually see that really easily and understand their own city um, in terms of this idea of access. So there you can see obviously like super underserved areas of the city um, where there's almost no access. And it's gonna basically be exhibited um, in City Hall and Buffalo City Hall is like a 38, 40 story tower and it has a view of the entire city. There's an observation deck at the top and on the inside of that observation deck there are these plaques photographic plaques that help you understand what you're looking at when you look out um, from the observation deck. Windows on Buffalo. So it's got all the different buildings indexed on there and numbered. And basically what, what my mountain will do, my landscape will do, is it will sit inside and you'll be able to like look at this invented landscape of the city that actually is potentially more accurate to people's experience of the city because it talks about how they move through it, not just what it looks like from above, 
but you'll be able to have the view simultaneously of that landscape with this kind of picturesque um, bird's eye view of Buffalo all at the same time. You can also see down at the bottom the, the parapet that runs you can walk all the way around this tower, and the parapet that runs it is kind of glazed this amazing color green. Um, so the, when the mountain sits in there, one of the things that I'll be doing is like trying to match that exact color green on all of the interior faces of this um, mountain, so that when they sit next to it, there will always be like, a, like about a half inch gap in between them. You'll see that color green, and then you'll also see the color green um, just beyond it, outside on the terrace, and then the city beyond. So uh, the funding's always an issue. It's a, it, thank you for that question. It's both uh, something that I struggle with and also that I'm happy that I figured out a way to, to do as many kind of crazy harebrained things um, without having like a, like a firm pay for it, an office pay for it. Or, or a lot of this is done actually without clients also, right? So a lot of it is done through um, grants, right? So they may be pretty minimal sometimes, but if it gives you an opportunity to travel, like let's say going to Sao Paulo, like I just decided I would pay for that on my own, so I just paid for the flight on my own. But when I got there, I had a, a fellowship and a residency to work and produce art there, right? And my art happens to be about urban research. Um, and so, you know, I was moving through the city probably in a way that maybe a lot of artists do, but not, I wasn't necessarily painting while I was there, right? I was taking notes, visiting people, talking to politicians and officials and learning what the situation was. Um, that has been a, a model that has been super helpful for me, like just residencies. I say this also because like residencies are open to anybody. Like once you guys get out of school, and sometimes even when you're, when you're in school, but usually once you get out of school, I would recommend starting to apply for residencies right away. You are, it's not like you're gonna make bank, right? Like you're gonna make more money probably out in industry for sure. But residencies allow you to stay alive and start to build a portfolio of work that is not client driven or brief driven, right? Like I invented the brief for each one of these projects. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do all of these types of projects if I was always dependent upon a client, right? Although the hope is that at a certain point, the, the research from these types of projects influences the research that's more client based, right? So I'm not necessarily showing the client-based work, but I do have those types of projects as well. Um, and, I, and again, the, it is influenced by this research. So mostly grants and fellowships. Yeah. That's like a great other half to this project that I haven't explored yet, which is probably due to a personal predilection, right? Like Because I actually, just another, you know, portion of my life is that I'm, I'm just an advocate for public transportation, right? Like, so of course when I get into this, I'm gonna be more interested in that half of the equation, right? But yes, the other access would be to see how much more accessible or inaccessible Los Angeles as a whole has become over time by car, right? And like, we could find certain areas where roads and development make it easier to get to if you have a car, right? And we can find other areas where because of traffic, it's much harder to get to now than it would have been 20 years ago, right? Or 30 years ago or 50 years ago, right? Like the dream, the fantasy of LA is that you can kind of like wake up in the morning and you know go to the desert and watch the sunrise in the desert, then go to the mountains and then catch sunset at the beach, right? Like that we can sample all these different landscapes. You know, the actuality of that, although 50 years ago we could do that, like these days it's pretty hard, right? Like because even on a Sunday in the afternoon, we're gonna hit traffic somewhere, you know. So yeah, it's it's changing and it would be great to actually index or map that. There would be another set of information I'd have to get access to, you know, like real data sets that I'd really have to kind of go through. I would need more funding for that. When you find another funding source for me, let me know. So I'm gonna need help to do a couple more things. And uh, we also wanna check on everything that's happened up here. So do you guys all wanna come up and gather around the two tables again? So that's a great question. So let's say we haven't gotten this one out, and as I promised, we're probably not going to get out. I apologize ahead of time. I think we will get this one out. We'll see. Um, we've got two casts. We know one of them is going to look pretty much just like that. We don't know what that looks like, right? You guys can maybe guess from what the mold looked like. But all this to say, 
we're gonna have two objects. You guys can see, I think like when I came here, I think that level is where my clay was. So you can kind of see that ring. It's basically like right around there. Basically I've used up like a little less than an inch of clay, right? Like it's extremely efficient. There's very, very few processes. That stuff that I poured back in here, it's gonna be just fine, right? Like even if it got a little bit of lump, lumps in it, like I could potentially take some of this stuff. I could take this and put it back in there. I'm gonna do it just to prove a point. I don't want to put plaster in there, right? Like that would mess everything up. So oftentimes you usually wouldn't put this stuff back in because there's always a chance that a little bit of plaster is going to lift up with it. And then if you get plaster in here and what happens is you cast and you've got a little flake of plaster in there, it blows out in the kiln because it has a different rate of expansion within the kiln. So, but one of the amazing things about clay is like, uh, do you mind grabbing that green thing at the end of the table over there? This one's probably the heaviest one that I brought with me. If you guys want to pass that around, that's the module from the, um, the ceramic house. You know, that thing is, it's heavy, but it's hollow. And in terms of all the ways that you could produce building components, it's a super efficient process, super low carbon footprint. There is a, there is a significant carbon footprint when you fire, right? Like you're, the energy comes from somewhere, right? Um, but compared to anything like concrete, steel, any of the other you know, materials that we build with typically, this has a, a lower carbon footprint. Um, and it's also, there's no, there's no waste, right? Like this is my, this would give me my waste for the day, this kind of stuff right here, right? So it's not like that's going into landfill and causing huge problems. Um, okay, so one of the things I wanna do is I'm just going to pour clay into here, and I'm going to imagine, or let's say I'd like, I have a project in my head that I still haven't been able to, to execute, which is that this is for Sao Paulo. Again, we, we talked about that, right? Um, there's almost like a performance art piece that I like to do where I go to Sao Paulo, and I sit on a bus, and I sit in the back of the bus, and I go as far out in the city as I can, so basically I go to the point of, well actually, you know what? I take it back. I need to start in downtown and I need to take the bus all the way to the end. And then I sit in the back of the bus and over the course of four hours, I very, very slowly pour in one minute for each minute that I'm on the bus, right? So that by the time I get to the end of my four hour journey, I've filled up my, my mold. So I'm gonna do that as slowly as I can right now. And we're gonna imagine that we're starting in downtown Sao Paulo, and then we're like moving through some of the historical parts of the city. Then we're like quickly moving out to some of the suburbs by train if possible, the ones where we get there the fastest. Then we're getting out to some of the hinterlands, like the real outskirts of the city. Then we're getting it out into some of the favelas where people like have so little access to transportation where they've built their own house out of whatever they could find. And then we start to have a leak. Ah. Can somebody take this little piece and stuff it under there? Yeah, let's see if that does it. Perfect. Do you mind stuffing this underneath here? Thank you. Okay. So we've got this, we'll let it sit for a couple minutes and then we'll pour it out. This guy, as we said, we can now see how we can just kind of like break off this clay. It's almost like self-cleaning. You wanna pass that around? Don't break it. And then here is where only heartache lies. But let's see, it's not that bad. Can you guys see what's happening over here? You guys can see this? Can you guys see that? It's almost like it's rubber. I, am, I think gravity's helping me out a little bit here because it's stuck on the bottom, but it's moving on the top. So I'm just gonna like turn the whole thing over for a second. And then I'm gonna try to do the same thing over here. Maybe I'm gonna turn it again. 
This is a really thin cast, and it's not quite dry enough to take out, but we're going to do it anyway. I think we're just going to. Yeah, there are a number of things I could do to make life easier here. Um, but normally, I wouldn't take it out after only an hour and a half, basically, right? This would be just fine. Um, OK, so let's see what happens if I just do this. All right, so we basically have like a souffle that went bad in the oven. Now you can see it's starting to deflate over here. Do we want to pass it around? <laughs> Scary, right? You guys are all welcome to just come touch it. You're not going to hurt it. You'll get fingerprints on it, but that'll be fine. Let's say there are some innovative techniques here, not necessarily slip casting, right? Like that's been around for hundreds of years. Um, but the, the desire to use it in different ways and to also input digital technology into it as well, could that scale up to something much larger, right? There are a couple pretty significant limit, limitations, right? Like number one, the size of your kiln, right? Like that the biggest thing I can make is basically the, the biggest thing that can fit in a kiln, right? So if I, can only have, if I only have a kiln this big, that's as big as the largest component I, I can produce would be, right? Like there are people who have experimented with, um, let's say like making an igloo and then putting a fire inside it and just making a self-burning architecture, a self-firing architecture. Uh, hard to know if that could really get up to the temperatures that you would need to do something that we would call infrastructural. You know, and especially at that point, like clay, uh, like concrete, works well in compression, not so well in tension. It's a friable, breakable material. There are ways that you can get around that, right? Like that thing over there on the corner of the table, it's, if that were just a box, like a really simple box that would, in a way, possibly be easier to produce, it would also be more fragile, right? Like the fact that it's crenellated gives it rigidity and gives it structure. Um, so there are things we can do to make clay perform better, but there are some inherent material limitations that we would have to deal with. Breaking would be a problem, right? Like, um, so it's, I, you, you know, you could get smarter in terms of the way you put components only into compression and never into tension, right? So that would actually be something where digital tools could help, um, and people are working on that right now. Would it be better than concrete? Not structurally, right? Like it would probably never be structurally better, um, but there could be other issues that would offset that problem, right? Like let's say carbon footprint or something. Uh, what do we have to do next? Got to open this guy, right? Okay. So I really didn't think we'd get that out. I'm I'm proud of us as a group. Um, <laughs> Who wants to do the honors? One volunteer. It's only going to happen once. OK, so the one thing is you want to try lift as straight as possible so you don't damage the whatever the thing is that's in there on your way up. It seems like she knows what she's doing. Is it getting stuck or is it coming up? I think you're doing good. Just right there, that little bit. Was that really you? I think so. Yeah, OK. So super, super tiny little mistake there, simply because the mold tipped a little bit in this direction, I think, right? Is that probably what it was? And then it was getting stuck somewhere, so I think, yeah. Yeah. At some point, so. Now I'll pass that around. You can touch it. Basically, what will happen is over the next three hours or something like that, it'll get cooler and cooler as more of the water evaporates off of it. So that same idea of evaporative cooling is at play here. Um, and it'll stay cool for the next couple days, potentially. And as soon as it's not cool anymore, that means that the, the moisture level, the moisture content of your clay has equilibrated with the moisture of the ambient air, right? So that means that it's probably a good time to put it in the kiln. 
So um, all of that like ends up being like super traditional techniques inside of clay that yes, I would use. And so what you always want to do, let's say ideally, is like you let things dry as slow as possible. Um, it's usually a big problem, like with the example that I was getting, where you'd have like something that you threw on the wheel that was really thin in one place and really thick in another place. You'd want to let that dry super slowly, right? For this kind of stuff, the good thing about slip casting is again, like because it it produces a thickness which is almost uniform everywhere. You don't really have to worry about that so much. So like seriously, that the this thing here, our, our souffle, our deflated souffle, and um, our whatever that other thing was, our mug, lid, something, I don't know. That thing, like, if I were to just leave that here with you guys and you let it sit out for the next couple days, you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. You know what I mean? Like, if you put it in the sun and put a fan on it, maybe in that case, one side of it, like the moon, you know, would, like, be super hot and the other side would be cool, and then you might get some cracking. But this is going to be just fine, like, sitting in a room or sitting outside, certainly as long as it's not in the sun. There's not a lot of moments when you want to dry something faster. It's usually about trying to get it to dry as slow as possible. Uh, I mean, you certainly could put a heat gun on it or something like that. Uh, and then you risk it cracking. But there are a lot of things like the more people know about ceramics, the more they can kind of like hold themselves up because they don't know too much, you know? So they'll be like, oh, don't do that because you'll crack it, right? Like, but then you just go try it and they're like, oh, it actually works, you know? Like some of these things, the rules, are still worth testing and worth challenging. So, but the rule would be, don't ever do anything that could possibly make it dry faster on one side than on the other side. And automatically when you've got a heat gun or a fan or something like that, unless you've got multiple ones directed on it, you're gonna make one side dry faster than the other. I need help pouring out this one last mold. Um, does anybody wanna pour it? It's heavy. Uh, okay, so then I just need somebody to help catch clay that might spill. Do you want to help? Uh -huh. yeah. All right, awesome. So it's just a matter of kind of like moving that thing around or moving me around because I can't see what I'm doing when I'm pouring. Denny already said we could spill on the table, so it's okay if we don't catch everything. All right. Okay, so you guys are totally welcome to come up and touch anything. Uh, we can... Here's this guy. You can see like the evidence of our mold making process right in there. Anything that's been slip cast from more than one mold part, you'll always find some kind of seam line. This is also one of these types of things where like now that you know about the process, just be looking at the world around you. You'll see so many ceramic objects that have a seam line on there. You have to look a little bit for it because oftentimes it's been sanded away somewhere later on down the line. Thanks, guys.